Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Duff, Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my honor to welcome you to the second lecture in the Society's new virtual lecture series on civics and American democracy. To present you tonight's lecture, we have once again partnered with jurists and volunteers from the Anthony M. Kennedy Library and Learning Center at the Sacramento Federal Judicial Library and Learning Center Foundation. And we're joined by teachers and alumni of the Society's Summer Institute for Teachers, as well as our members of the Society. Thank you all very much for joining us. A critical element of the Supreme Court Historical Society's mission is to educate the public about how crucial an independent Supreme Court of the United States and the federal judiciary as a whole is to the protection of our freedoms. In this regard, the society is hosting a series of lectures focused on illuminating and educating the public about threats, both internal and external ones, to judicial branch independence specifically and to our form of government more generally. We began our series with a lecture on methods that foreign governments are using to exploit differing viewpoints in our country to sow distrust in the public's opinion of our institutions and specifically of the judiciary. Tonight's lecture will focus on what is occurring in other countries where judicial independence is being undermined by actions from within their own governments. We hope this sheds light on what Americans need to be aware of when considering legislation or other internal government actions affecting the judicial branch in our own system of government. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce Professor Kimberly Lane Shepley, the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and uh, University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. She is going to deliver tonight's lecture. Professor Shepley's work focuses on the intersection of constitutional and international law, particularly in constitutional systems under stress. Professor Shepley has studied the emergence of constitutional law in Hungary and Russia, living in both places for extended periods. After 9-11, she researched the effects of the international war on terror on constitutional protections around the world. Since 2010, she has been documenting the rise of autocratic legalism, first in Hungary and then in Poland within the European Union, as well as its spread around the world. Her many publications in law reviews, in social science journals, and in several languages cover these topics and others. Professor Shepley is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the International Academy of Comparative Law. In 2014, she received the Law and Societies Association's Calvin Prize for Influential Scholarship. She is a member of the Executive Committee of the International Association of Constitutional Law, elected as a global jur jurist. From 2017 to 2019, she was the elected president of the Law and Society Association. I was honored to appear with Kim on a panel discussion recently at the Third Circuit Judicial Conference of the United States. And I thought that her presentation there needed to be shared with a broader audience. And we're just very delighted she's with us tonight. She's going to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we will take questions from you, the audience, and ask you to submit them, please, in advance in the Q&A window of Zoom. And we will get to as many of those as we can. Kim, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jim. And I'm really honored to be here and, and honored to uh, have a chance to talk with an audience that really cares about judicial independence in the United States. And unfortunately, I'm gonna bring you some bad news about what's happening in judicial independence in the rest of the world. So unfortunately, um, all over the world now, democracy is in trouble. 
the number of countries that started the century as robust democracies is shrinking. And the democracies that remain are by and large in worse shape than they were 20 years ago. So there's been something called, you know, we call it democratic backsliding that's occurring all over the world. And part of the reason why this is happening is that I think people haven't recognized that actually there's a new, a new pattern. There's a new way that democracies collapse. So it used to be, you know, that there would be a coup, tanks in the streets, as we would say, that it was really evident when democracy was over because there'd be some sudden sharp event that would call it all off. Um, and now there's really a very, very different pattern. Um, what we see now is that autocratic leaders who aspire to stay in power forever win free and fair elections, often fair and square the first time. Um, and then they set about trying to stay in power longer than their constitutions permit. And so how do they do this? Well, to stay in power for a long time, what somebody needs to do uh, is they essentially have to disable all the constitutional checks and balances that would otherwise require them to leave office. Now, how does that start? Well, that starts usually by attacking the judiciary because who's gonna tell you that what you're doing is unconstitutional except a judiciary pledge to uphold a constitution. And so one of the first steps in autocratic capture of democratic governments is going after the judiciary. And I'm gonna focus on that with most of my remarks tonight, but let me just tell you a little bit more about the scenario because it's happening over and over again, country after country. It's the same pattern in Russia. And you know, here we are on the eve of Russia invading Ukraine again. And I've taught constitutional law in Ukraine and in Russia, this is close to home, but Russia was once, we thought it could be democratic and then it took this path. Venezuela, Ecuador, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, the Philippines, now India. Those are the ones that have really gone so far that they're teetering on the brink of not being democracies at all. Some have already gone off the edge. So it's a widespread phenomenon. So how does it happen? Well, first there's an election. There's some fatal election where the person with autocratic ambition comes to power. That usually happens with a combination of two things. One is a party system in trouble where there's a, maybe a traditional party that doesn't put up a candidate or an opposition splits or something is there some malfunction in the party system that gets an autocrat onto the ballot. Then um, in addition to that, there's often some kind of counter majoritarian device in the election procedure. So something that enables somebody who doesn't win the popular vote to nonetheless get into the top office. And that can happen. I mean, we know that in the US through the electoral college, but it often happens in other places through various forms of disproportional counting. Um, so those kinds of things combine and that often brings the aspirational autocrat into power. So then what happens? Well, I've just told you he attacks the judiciary, but it's not just the judiciary. It's often a set of very specific offices. So in addition to the judiciary, the aspiring autocrat attacks or wants to capture the prosecutor's office to prevent inquiries into his own activity and to direct prosecutorial interest in his enemies. Capturing the audit and tax offices are really crucial. In fact, we just saw this yesterday, there was a spectacle in Hungary, which is the place I work on the most these days in which um, a really revered religious figure, a guy who runs homeless shelters and does nothing but care for the poor, was set upon by 30 armed tax police <laughs> who arrested him in a homeless shelter. And you know, this is welcome to Viktor Orban's country in which this guy had contemplated running for president a few weeks earlier and now not. So capturing the audit and tax offices are crucial. Police reorganization. It's crucial that if you're gonna become an autocrat, you want the police under your control. Ditto with the military and ditto with election offices, which become very important sites of capture for leaders with autocratic ambitions. So this is kind of the playbook. So within governments, those are the crucial offices. 
And then apart from the judiciary, which I'm gonna, like I said, talk about more than any of the others, this is just the, the list, the context in which this happens, other independent institutions also come under attack. So the media. So the media often come under financial pressure because advertiser pressure not to advertise. Government itself no longer advertises and, or provides any kind of support for media. Oligarchs close to the autocrat buy out unfriendly media and flip it to the autocrat's liking. In addition to media, civil society organizations come under pressure, either through tax laws, through various forms of supervision, sometimes through infiltration, um, also opposing political parties. So you'll discover after that free and fair election that only all the parties that didn't win get fined by the election office for violating obscure campaign finance rules, for example. Religious organizations come under attack, essentially, and universities as well. Anything that could provide a basis for organizing against the autocrat, you know, start to come under um, pressure. And eventually, as the, you know, it's a little bit into the autocrat's first term, what you start to see are radical changes to the election rules, changes to election administration, changes to the way votes are counted, perhaps changes to electoral districts, so that the second election of the autocrat is no longer free and fair. So that's the playbook, okay? That's something that we've seen happen in country after country. And the reason why it's so difficult to spot while it's going on is that there are still no tanks in the streets, you know? And there may be other processes that just look like they're going on as usual. Life looks normal. It's just this institution changes a bit and then that institution changes a bit and then this other. So when you live in a country going through it, it's sometimes, you wonder whether it's your imagination that everything has changed. It's not the sudden dramatic uh, attack. So I want to focus now on what happens to judiciaries, because within any of these institutions I've mentioned, you can drill down and ask, how did they do it? You know, how did they make a formerly independent institution much less independent? And here I'm going to draw from the two cases I've been focusing on the most uh, lately, namely Hungary and Poland. Um, I lived and worked in Hungary for four years in the 1990s. I worked at the Constitutional Court, which was a new court, which was a very um, important court. It really um, brought Hungary from, you know, sort of dictatorship into democracy under its guidance. Um, and in Poland, where, again, the Constitutional Tribunal there was a, a very important court in the whole democratic transition. And both of these courts were designed to uphold democratic values. The whole judiciaries had actually become, you know, bulwarks of constitutional thinking and the rule of law. And unfortunately, in both countries now, over the last decade, they've come under incredible attack. I might say, by the way, because of what's happening out there in the world, that of course, both Hungary and Poland are NATO partners. They're also members of the EU, a club of constitutional democracies, and there are many strong ties between these countries and the United States. So these are. These are countries that we thought were part of our ecosystem of, of constitutional democracies. So what happened when these two countries decided to attack their judiciaries? Well, Viktor Orban came to power in 2010 and almost immediately began an assault on the judiciary. Um, his Fidesz political party was in parliament with a majority big enough to change the constitution. In Poland, Jaroslaw Kaczynski came to power with his peace party, his uh, law and justice party. Uh, and they had a majority, again, that could sort of pass a lot of new laws. So what did they do first? Well, first they changed the judicial appointments process. So in Hungary, you needed first a majority of political parties to elect a judge to the constitutional court followed by two thirds of the parliament. The, Fidesz parliament eliminated the first step. So all you needed was two thirds of the parliament, which they had. And every single judge appointed since 2010 has been appointed with the same parliamentary majority. So there is not a single judge who didn't come through the filtering process of one political party. In Poland, they simply put illegally elected judges onto the court and the court resisted and they just the government didn't publish the decisions of the court. I mean, it was a whole standoff, but in the end, 
the government won. And now you have a packed constitutional court done through illegal appointments. But again, who's going to tell you it's illegal if the court that would tell you it's illegal has been captured, right? So the appointments process was really compromised. Um, in addition, that was, you know, and these, these are systems where there's a constitutional court where the judges are appointed in a special process, rather like the U.S. system for appointing federal judges, where every judge kind of goes through a separate confirmation process through the legislature. But in most of these countries, the judiciary is a civil service judiciary where you go to law school, you take the judge's track, you come out as a baby judge, you get promoted through the hierarchy. And that required a different kind of compromise. So, you know, in those cases, what you saw was judges typically govern the appointment of other judges in the ordinary judiciaries in most European countries. And there, the national judicial councils were captured. Um, so, you know, what would happen is that friendly judges, judges who were known to be, you know, um, in league with the governing party, would get put onto these, um, these judicial appointments bodies. In Hungary, they created a separate office where one person was literally selecting all the judges. And once that happens, it becomes very difficult for the other judges who were saying, what's going on here? Somehow the bench is changing, the tone is changing. These folks are coming in with an agenda. But it's very hard, and this is one of the dilemmas with judicial independence in general, because judges don't feel like they can defend themselves. They're not going to go out and, you know, stand on the street corner with a sign saying my court is being compromised, right? This is just something judges don't do. So one of the dilemmas when courts are attacked, especially through these appointment processes, is that other people need to be able to speak for the courts if they don't speak for themselves. But this is where, again, in these sort of autocratic systems, what you see is that opinions of the bar, opinions of professional legal associations, and opinions of professional judges are all shunted aside in the process of judicial appointments. You also see these kinds of political influences then sneak into judicial appointment uh, promotion processes. And so these two have become completely politicized, where the people who are assessing judges for advancement, are looking primarily at whether those judges are in political agreement with the government of the day or the year or the decade, and as, as has happened in some of these cases. So first, loyal judges are put in charge of picking the others for promotion, or sometimes you even get outside influences in the promotion process. But the promotion process is also compromised. And then what happens? Well, then you go to disciplinary proceedings. And every judiciary has to have within it some process for ascertaining whether a judge has actually lived up to the high expectations of that office. And so there, there are, within well-functioning judiciaries, a process that works inside the judiciary to investigate and examine and, if necessary, recommend for removal certain judges who have not performed their jobs in an ethical or professional manner. Now, what you see in a lot of these autocratic countries is that the disciplinary proceedings are exactly, you know, put the judiciary under a lot of pressure. So in Poland, for example, what they did was to create a special disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court that was in charge of disciplining judges. So what could be wrong with that? It was judges disciplining judges but it was a specially appointed chamber. And because of the way they changed the judicial appointments process, the only judges put onto that chamber were judges who were affiliated with the ruling party. And then they got to run all the disciplinary procedures. In Hungary, instead, the disciplinary procedures were run by presidents of courts, but all the presidents of courts had been selected in this process where it was political loyalty more than other judicial qualifications that put somebody into the presidencies of those courts. So the, again, once you compromise the appointments process, once you've got somebody political in charge of putting judges in particular places in the judiciary, this can also affect the disciplinary uh, process. And that's happened in these countries. So political interference in the choice of court leadership. In Poland in 2017, the parliament passed a law that in one fell swoop fired all the court presidents across the system and replaced them with somebody else. 
Now, obviously, that's going to make a huge difference um, in how the judiciary is run. And here again, the political appointments process swoops in and picks court leadership. So another way that ju judicial appointments can be compromised is by suddenly changing the qualifications for what it means to be a judge. And this is something else I've, you know, we've seen again, I'm looking just at Poland and Hungary, but I could multiply the examples. In both Hungary and in Poland, one way they decapitated the judiciary. And again, remember that the ordinary judiciary in these countries is like a civil service judiciary. So you start, you know, young in a small court. And by the time you get promoted through the ranks, you're nearing retirement. And so in both countries, both Hungary and Poland, first Hungary, then Poland, they lowered the judicial retirement age effective immediately in Hungary and Poland from 70 to 62. And so in Hungary, the top 15% of the judiciary was fired overnight, 40% of the Supreme Court. Um, in Poland, fortunately, because it came second, the European Court of Justice stepped in and said, no, you can't do that. And you have to keep the current judges in place till we issue an opinion on this. And so in the end, the judges weren't fired, but that was because Hungary had gone first and they hadn't acted fast enough and all the judges were out. So here too, again, sudden changes in judicial qualifications, changing the number of years of service before promotion, a number of changes of qualifications that may look neutral, but are designed to get certain judges to get through faster than others. And then we get into some of the details of how courts work. And these are things that are really invisible to the general public, but absolutely crucial to the operation of an independent judiciary. Which judges hear what cases? Now, you know, in, in, in good judiciaries that have remained independent, there's usually some kind of, you know, algorithmic process. Judges, cases are assigned at random to judges so that nobody's picking the judge for the specific case who may have an agenda. Um, in the countries that have destroyed judicial independence, the case assignment process is also captured. And again, in both Hungary and Poland, the reason for getting rid of all those court presidents was that the court presidents still assign specific cases to specific judges. And that was really one of the most crucial elements. And it's hard to, it's hard to explain because you know, when the case is decided, you don't see the process through which that judge got the case or that panel of judges got the case. But now in both countries, there are politically appointed judges who do the case assignment. Also the composition of panels. So, you know, once you get above a single trial judge and you've got, you know, three, five, seven judges on appeal, who composes the panels? Here too, in both Hungary and Poland, the process of, of designing those panels is not done randomly or not done in some neutral process, but is done by the same people who do the case assignments. So now, you know, any case the governments care about in those countries can always be funneled to uh, compliant judges. Hi, oh, my goodness. So then what else? Well, the other thing that happens and, you know, is, is that the politicians get extremely interested in the outcome of specific cases. So there have been cases, there's one famous case in Hungary where um, the judge, um, it was a case involving a, um, a hit and run accident. The driver was from Slovakia. The, the, the woman and her son who were killed were Hungarian. And sort of an ordinary hit and run case, I mean, horrible, but ordinary hit and run case didn't look very political. But the trial judge said, allowed the woman to, um, to not be jailed pending the trial. And the government was completely up in arms that she would go back to Slovakia and we'd never get her back again. Never mind that there's a European arrest warrant system that guarantees her being turned over. The government yelled about the case. The justice minister got out there and a couple of other members of the cabinet got out there and yelled about this woman being let go. The chief judge of that court <laughs> took the case back, reassigned it to a different judge, and they made a different decision in the afternoon. There are cases like that now in Hungary and you just look at them and you realize the judiciary cannot be independent. Changing jurisdictional rules. So, you know, another thing we've seen both in Hungary and Poland is that there's now a way for cases to go straight from the trial court. If the trial judge makes a ruling the government doesn't like, the government can appeal or the prosecutor can appeal the case straight to the highest court that is more reliably packed. 
and miss the middle level that they had a little more trouble capturing. So you get these, you know, if you if some of you may remember the childhood game shoots and ladders, you know, where you go along the playing board and suddenly you go way up to the top or suddenly you go way down to the bottom and they've changed the rules about how cases move in the judiciary. So you're not just going level by level up the usual chain of appeals, but cases can go all the way to the top and then they can be referred back to the bottom. And it's a way again, to kind of get friendly judges. So there's more to be said, but that gives you a sense of what's it like to live in a country where your judiciary has been captured. You know, it means that no matter, you know, you want to enforce an ordinary contract. Unfortunately, you need a divorce. There's been an, a, a sickness or an accident in your family, you need the judges to intervene. Or worse yet, it's a, const, a case of constitutional importance where you're counting on the independence of some other institution or the reliability of some administrative decision in your case. You know, courts are involved in all of those cases. And if, it, if your case comes up and the government cares about your case, the judiciary is no longer independent in those countries. You know, ordinary cases, maybe if the government doesn't care about, you might be lucky to get an independent judge. But for any case the government cares about, they can guarantee particular outcomes. And when you live in a country like that, it feels like there is no law. It's all discretion. It feels like the constitution has evaporated. And in both cases, of course, people stop trusting the courts. So I'm, I'm telling you these stories because it's, a, it's an incredible tragedy in, you know, in these other countries, but you might say, you know, that's far away. Are there lessons for the US? Can it happen here? And you know, I think the US is lucky to have as you know, many, I mean, how to put it, independence of the judiciary is a fundamental principle in the US. And yet there are some things that are fraying. Suddenly for the first time, in my career, and I'm rather old, so have been at this a long time, suddenly for the first time, trust in the Supreme Court of the United States has gone below 50%. It's been bouncing around for a while, but the courts are underwater. And many Americans don't really, can't tell the difference between the Supreme Court and the, and the other courts in the federal judiciary and the state courts and so on. So the most visible, courts, the reputation of the most visible court spreads to the other courts as well. So what's been happening? Well, it's now, I think, not particularly a secret to say that appointments, particularly at Supreme Court level, have become so, so politicized that it looks like, you know, whoever's entitled to make the appointment is going to grab an ideological ally as young as possible to stay on the court as long as possible potentially as extreme as possible to keep their side of things, you know, um, uh, you know anchored uh, as firmly on their side as possible. Once the process of Supreme Court appointments is as politicized as it is, it becomes hard for people to believe that that's not true all the way down in the judiciary. And I might say it's even worse at the state level. I mean, the US is the only advanced democracy on earth that has so many judges who have to run for election and get campaign contributions and you know, stand for retention elections and all of those things. I mean, when I have to, when I explain this to my foreign colleagues, they all say, how can you possibly do that? Because it, in fact, the, the point about judicial independence is that you're insulated from pressures, not just from political officials, but also from the public. Um, and so this is again, you know, something else where there's this opportunity for judges to take stands. Um, the courts are now being treated as political, which is, you know, you've all read the newspaper accounts where you know, up and down the, the chain, you know, there'll be a decision and next to the judge, there'll be a little R or a little D, which is to say the decisions, decisions are being reported that way. And I don't want to just blame the journalists here. I used to be a journalist, actually, so I'm rather fond of journalists. Um, but part of it is that the journalists wouldn't do that if they didn't think it explained something. And unfortunately, the more they do it and the more explanatory power the partisan labels have, the more the public is inclined to, is being offered the view that these decisions are partisan. And so we're seeing, you know, and, and now I think we're also seeing 
pressures on the judiciary coming from outside the judiciary. So pending before Congress right now, for example, is something called the Judicial Accountability Act, right? What could be wrong with that, right? But what it proposes is a disciplinary proceeding. And again, I've talked to you about disciplinary proceedings as one of the weak spots um, that politicians often try to control. <laughs> Excuse me. We see this coming home because under the Judicial Accountability Act, disciplinary matters in the judiciary would get referred not within the judiciary as they're handled now, but out to a quote, independent commission that reports directly to the president. That's the kind of nightmare scenario I've seen in other countries. And this is now sitting before the Congress of the United States. So there are more pressures being brought to bear on a judiciary, <coughs> excuse me, that is weakened, I think, because public opinion believes that the judiciary is already politicized even if it isn't, especially in the lower courts where ordinary cases don't rise to this political level. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough one minute. Sorry, I just muted myself so I wouldn't blow your ears out. Um, so we have now, I think, a kind of wounded judiciary, you know, wounded in public opinion, set upon by Congress. The judiciary needs defenders. And so this is why I wanna to appeal to all of you when you see a judiciary that becomes less independent, it really is a disaster to live in such a country. I, know. I knew I was gonna get a tickle in my throat, sorry about that. To lose an independent judiciary is to lose constitutional democracy. So what can be done? This is where the bar needs to stand up for judges. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the bar is, can speak in ways that judges can't. Other defenders of the courts, like those of you who are here, can speak out for the judiciary, can look at the efforts to try to bring the judiciary to political heel and stand against them. Civic education matters. In fact, one of my, you know, one of, I used to teach at Penn Law School. I've taught at many law schools, both here and in Europe. And one thing that I find a little bit alarming about the American educational system is that you have to wait to get a postgraduate degree to learn a lot of law. I'm actually in favor of us bringing law degrees down to the college level, even more to educate you know, K through 12 students in the basic principles of constitutionalism and an independent judiciary because constitutional democracy is really worth defending. And the only way it can be defended is if people realize what's at stake. So the US may have the oldest continually operating constitution in the world. We can discuss the Civil War and Lincoln because it was President's Day later, but still we have an old constitution. We can often be lulled into thinking that because the constitution has gotten the US through so many troubled times, it is still there to protect us. But one of the things I've seen is that, you know, to quote a phrase, all that solid melts into air. We thought Hungary and Poland were on the right track 20 years ago. They looked like, and they were moving in the direction of being absolutely solid democracies. Some of these other constitutional democracies that have really fallen on, on hard times were among the strongest in their regions. This is not something that you get a free pass out of because you've had a long history of constitutional government. The judiciary is always very vulnerable because it can't defend itself very easily. So the judiciary needs friends, constitutional democracy needs friends. And one of the reasons to pay attention to these developments around the world is that you begin to recognize the symptoms when they start to creep up on you in your own home country. And I must say, I'm worried about the United States right now and I'm worried about the judiciary right now. And I hope that you all share with me the sense that an independent judiciary is worth defending and it's the responsibility of all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, that was enlightening and inspirational. And I hope uh, our audience uh, takes you up on the urging to um, support an independent judiciary and speak out for them. Um, you mentioned that judges do not 
like uh, feel like they could defend themselves and in, 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 you mentioned in Hungary and in, in, in Poland and much can be the same uh, said about the, the judiciary here. And it's, it's somewhat circular, isn't it, that uh, our judges can, uh, an independent judiciary can defend a free press through constitutional uh, rulings. And uh, it's sort of uh, up to uh, the free press to uh, speak out and point out when the judiciary may be under uh, a, attack or uh, there, there's some erosion in its independence that is fostered by the other branches. Um, the question um, uh, is how uh, legislation can be disguised to be um, something that uh, people would uh, support uh, on its face, but underneath it, underlying that legislation is really an effort to weaken the independence of the judiciary. And uh, so can, can you, you've seen examples of that, I take it, in, in Hungary and Poland. And what, what, what is the guy, what was the guise of the legislation that was appealing to people and, and before they knew it, uh, what had happened was there was a usurpation of power and independence out of the judiciary. Yeah, well, all the efforts to attack the judiciary always come shrouded in virtue, right? So like the Judicial Accountability Act, what could be wrong with a law with that title? Well, what was happening in Hungary and Poland, for example, take the judicial retirement age. It just happened that around the time that happened in Hungary, the judges above that age had all gotten their law degrees under communism. And so it was a, why are we have the, having these communist judges around? Okay, never mind that they'd already been there for more than 20 years judging just fine. Um, you know, so, so that was part of the reason. But the other reason, and this is really, uh, um, uh, I've seen in some countries, our judiciary is too slow. They're not handling cases quickly enough. So we need more judges. And then the more judges becomes an opportunity for packing courts. Um, actually, what happened in Turkey was really an interesting thing when their constitutional court was captured. It happened in two stages. The first thing that um, Mr. Erdogan did was um, applauded everywhere. They gave the constitutional court jurisdiction over millions of little human rights cases. And by little, I mean important to the one person whose rights had been affected, but they didn't shatter the system, shall we say. And they increased the caseload of the constitutional court. And then the court was drowned in cases. And then the next year, Mr. Erdogan said, I'm such a defender of the constitutional court. We need to add all these new judges. And then they were all his judges. And then the next thing you knew that all the big cases that came to that court went his way, right? So it was, it, they come in incredibly clever fashions, right? It's always because of some good reason and then it leads to, again, a kind of capture. So what you always have to look at in these laws is not what's the reason why you need to fix the judiciary. Often it's a legitimate reason. It's how do you fix it, right? And does the fix ultimately get tracked back to putting a political hand into the middle of the judiciary? So, you know, a, a one red flag is taking disciplinary procedures outside the judiciary. Another is suddenly expanding the size of a court and putting all the judges, how to put it, put all, putting all the eggs in one basket from the standpoint of appointments. It's the same person or the same process that appoints all of them. So you can expect them all to kind of look alike. And so those are the kinds of things you have to watch out for. But, you know, it's, I mean, this is the interesting thing about the way democracies collapse now. It always collapses because you think there's a good idea. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody came and said, I am going to destroy your constitutional democracy, everybody would stand up and fight, right? It's, it's because somebody is going to, you know, um, uh, you know, save the world, fix poverty, fix whatever. And you vote for these folks based on some, you know, malady that needs to be fixed. But then their fixes are, you know, the fixes all have the same direction, which is it removes constraints from the executive by making everybody else dependent on that executive. So that's the thing to watch for. 
you know, never look at the headline on what the thing's trying to fix. Look at the machinery through which they're trying to fix it. Are there voices speaking out against what's going on in, in Hungary and Poland? And are, uh, if, or, or are they being silenced? Mm -hmm. um, uh, which is to say, is there uh, any semblance of freedom of speech and freedom of press in those countries that a, an independent judiciary as in the United States could defend if the other branches of government were intruding on those freedoms? Yeah, so this is one of the problems, of course, is once you've lost the independence of the judiciary, your free speech rights aren't enforced either, you know. Right. And right. actually in Poland, um, what was interesting as the judiciary was being captured, there would be demonstrations of tens of thousands of people with these signs like save our judges. You know? uh, there used to be these save our judges demonstrations in Egypt and Pakistan too when the courts were attacked. So it's really interesting that in some countries people will go to the streets to save the judiciary. Um, and so what started happening was, they, was that the government started bringing libel actions against the leaders of those demonstrations for insulting the political leaders. You know, and, this, and the cases wouldn't go anywhere because, you know, you can't insult. I mean, in most constitutional democracies, insulting political leaders is par for the course, but you can tie up people with lawyers fees. You can drag this through. And if you've captured enough friendly judges, you mm -hmm. can even get the case to a friendly judge and then, you know, either rule against the person or tie them in knots for a long time. So they use those measures against the people speaking in favor of the judiciary. So then the judiciary started speaking for itself. They started criticizing, you'd have the National Council of Judges, which was elected by their fellow judges speaking out against the judicial reforms. And then the government passed what has come to be known as the muzzle law, which is in the name of judicial independence, they said, you cannot speak on matters like this because this is a matter for the political branches, not for the judicial branches, what the new disciplinary system looks like. They were punishing judges who were sending cases to the European courts you know, for review, for example, because mm -hmm. you can't criticize. So the muzzle law is still in effect, actually. The European um, Commission has tried to file a case against Poland, but this has been taking quite a long time to be resolved. So, you know, it's um, the governments can sort of fight back against the people who are defending the judiciary. And then the, when the judiciary stands up for itself, they, they go after them. So, you know, what's been interesting is that in Poland, the civil society is pretty vibrant and it's been pushing back because the capture of all the other institutions wasn't complete. One mm -hmm. reason why I went through that litany at the beginning was to say that if it's just the judiciary, which has sort of been the case in Poland, all the other ones kind of stand up for it and it makes it harder to fully capture it. In Hungary, where there was a blitz of everything at once, you know, the universities were attacked, 300 um, religious organizations were suddenly deregistered and thrown out of the country. I mean, all this stuff was happening at once. And so everybody hunkers down on their own institution and you don't get the mass protest against what's happening to the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, one of the questions from the audience, are there uh, reforms that nations who have seen the politicization of their judiciary have taken to restore faith in their system? Yeah, I'll tell you, this is really hard, right? So it's much easier to make fish soup out of a fish tank than to do it the other way around, right? So <laughs> this is the dilemma. Once you've got a, a compromised judiciary, how do you deal with it? Well, What's interesting is to look at what happened at the end of communism in all those, you know, all the countries that came out from under Soviet influence after 1989, every single one of them adopted a constitutional court. So they took their ordinary judiciary and they built a new court on top of it, whose job was to enforce the new constitutions in these countries and to take, <coughs> excuse me, um, rights cases and ensure that this judiciary, because most countries don't have a spare judiciary in their pocket, right? I mean, you come to the end of a regime and you're not gonna find thousands of new judges who were suddenly prepared to, to come into office. So you're usually dealing with the judiciary you have. Mm -hmm. So the thing to do is to put another court on top of it and have there be some appeal avenue so that decisions made by the lower court judges can be disciplined from within the judiciary itself. So. That's what they did all over Eastern Europe, actually. Excuse me. 
the problem now is that those countries have now compromised that court. The constitutional mm-hmm. courts were the first ones they went after. So I, I've been actually working with a team of people on this um, in Hungary. And one of the things that's now being discussed is, I mean, actually it's happened in Poland and it may happen in Hungary. These, these countries are nested in the European Union. Mm-hmm. The European Union, independently of the national legal systems requires that countries have independent judiciaries. And it's possible either through the European Court of Human Rights or the European Court of Justice to bring a case that will find that a court is, quote, not a court, (laughs) in quotes. So in other words, their decisions cannot be recognized in European law. And so some of us are thinking that if you use the European courts to get a highly politicized court declared to be not a court, it may be possible to dismantle it and then create another court in its place, but there are real rule of law issues there. You know, so that's why some of us have been saying, well, let's go through the other parallel legal system and come at it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, but that's, you know, you need the parallel legal system. You know, mm-hmm. many parts of the world don't have that parallel legal system to go through. At the inception, you alluded to this, but it sounded, sounds as if 10, 15 years ago, Hungary and Poland was well on a path uh, of, of a model in, uh, of, of independence in the judicial branch there? And was it modeled after the American system? And if so, how did, how did it get off that track? I mean, what, what was it? Because, I mean, you use a wonderful phrase at the very beginning that, the, you know, there were no tanks involved in this takeover. Right. right. Um, and it's all been done through law. Uh, right. And, and disguised laws. Right. Um, but how, how was it, it got so off track? And, and what, what's the difference between our system and what's happening there? Yeah, well, so I think it's a, it's a great question. And the usual answer is, well, you know, the people elected this autocrat, <laughs> the guy who was gonna, and they had plenty of warning, you know, but he didn't, in, in Hungary and Poland, when Poland, in both cases, these guys have been in power before. So you had a little bit of a sense that if you were paying attention, they might be dangerous. Um, and they elected the autocrat and it's the people's fault. Okay, so I actually don't buy that. Actually, what I think is that democracies don't die because people fail to support them. They're murdered. <laughs> mm-hmm. These are leaders that had plans to, to kill off democracy. And one of the dilemmas, of course, is that everything depends on how your system of checks and balances is structured. Mm -hmm. And every constitutional system has what I think of as like a resonant frequency point, you know, that that pitch that breaks the glass, right? In Hungary, the resonant frequency point was that they had an election law that gave many more seats in the parliament, disproportionately more seats in the parliament to the plurality winner of an election. And so Viktor Orban got, well, he got 53% of the vote in 2010, but he got 68% of the seats in the parliament. And that was combined with the fact that they had a constitution that could be amended by a single two thirds vote of a unicameral, unicameral parliament. Mm-hmm. And you combine those two things and there's no legal constraint on the government. Mm-hmm. Nobody thought about that when they drafted the constitution, right? The problem I worry about in the US is that our system of checks and balances assumes that every institution is going to defend its own prerogatives. So the Senate should be very (laughs) Senate-ish, the House should Mm -hmm. be the House-ish, and the White House should have a conflict with Congress because they're different institutions and one checks the other, and the judiciary checks the whole system, and the states have their own prerogatives. And so our system of checks and balances is designed for institutional Mm self-defense. So then what happens if you have another force, let's call it a political party, that cuts across all those institutions, disabling the institutional checks because the party is going to work with the party, with the party across all the institutions and up and down through the system of federalism. It just disables the whole way the system works. Mm -hmm. You know, and famously, of course, the framers of the US Constitution didn't think about political parties, but that could be the device that undermines everything right? Because that, against that, our system is defenseless. 
-hmm. you know, and other, I can go on about other systems, but, you know, almost every system, it's hard to design a constitutional system against all forms of abuse like that. <clears throat> and so if you've got clever strategic actors who aspire to autocratic rule, and they're clever enough. And by the way, lawyers are always involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, one thing I'm mortified about in Hungary is that some of the lawyers involved there were my former students, you know? So I always tell my students now, like, don't do that. But, you know, with a set of clever lawyers, you can figure out where are the resonant frequency points in this constitutional system and systematically disable them. That's what's going on. If the public knew they wouldn't approve it, you still have in Hungary and in Poland, the highest level of support for independent judiciary, free and fair elections, you know, thinking the EU is great. The two countries that wind up on the top of all the polls that say the EU is the greatest thing that ever happened to our country, Hungary and Poland. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so it's not the people really, it's, it's the lawyers and the politicians, right? In this unholy marriage to try to no. get an autocrat to stay in power for him. Can, can you chart what, I, I mean, it's another great question from the audience, can you chart what the alternate paths in our country might look like? For example, if the Judicial Accountability Act passes, uh, let's hope not, uh, has the dam burst, or what could attorneys and judges do then to prevent further erosion of judicial independence? And there are a couple of follow-up questions to this, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, so, I mean, the worry is that, um, well, I mean, what may save the judiciary is that Congress can't pass anything, right? Yeah. Which is to say that the dysfunction in Congress is such that maybe that saves the courts. Okay, so that's that's not maybe the answer that you wanted. But I think, you know, when you yeah. <laughs> well, in that case, it would be, you know, paralysis might be a good thing in Congress. But, but here's the problem. What you see is that there's a public demand or there's a, demand that the Congress is channeling to, you know, that the, that somehow the judiciary has not done its own disciplinary work effectively, mm -hmm. and therefore it needs to be supervised, right? So how to deal with that? So, you know, one thing the judiciary can do is to come forward with more publicity about here's how we do it, you know, public education about, because of course the federal judiciary, as you know better than anyone, has internal disciplinary mechanisms. Mm -hmm. The cases that have hit the press have all also been dealt with internally. You know, it's just that judges don't talk about these things, right? Uh, and maybe they shouldn't talk about these things, but when the judiciary is under attack, it may make sense for the judiciary to say, here's the procedure that we already use you know, and that there is this system and it's not broken and it doesn't need to be fixed, <laughs> you know, and, and this is where, again, the judiciary gets weakened by the perception that it's political, no. right. you know, and, and, it's and, it, and, and, and it's, and you've, you've hit on something uh, in, in describing the situations in Hungary and Poland that exist here too. And that is that judges are very hesitant to defend themselves and to get out there. So, but it, it, when there's something like this that is so threatening to judicial independence, it really calls upon, I think, the branch and others who are paying attention to speak out uh, on their behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow-up questions on this uh, line. Uh, if the Judicial Account Accountability Act does not pass, how relieved should we feel <laughs> I, I can answer that one very. <laughs> very. <laughs> or, or but it may what, not be uh, over, right? <laughs> but this is the real question. What is the work that remains to be done uh, yeah. if, if, you know, after this? Yeah. Well, so I think that, you know, the question is, I mean, I think this, this drop in public support for the courts is really serious. Mm -hmm. I think this needs a kind of campaign mm -hmm. um, of, mm -hmm promotion of the independent judiciary. Um, one of the things that may mean is making the judiciary more ordinary, so to speak, which is to say, if the judiciary is only identified with the highest profile five, four, six, three, you know, cases of an enormous political importance, the public doesn't realize that 99.9% .9 of what the courts do is not that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so actually, so here's a really funny, I mean, here's the thing that I would love to see in the U.S. 
um, it, they had it in communist Hungary. Um, one thing that when I first moved to Hungary right after the wall came down, one thing that I was so impressed by was how much law the average person knew. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and, and ordinary law in Hungary was not as, you know, as bad as you might guess. But anyway, they had this show. It wasn't Judge Judy. It wasn't one of these other like fake judge shows, right? It was a show <laughs> that actually reenacted real cases and explained the law of them. Mm-hmm. Right? Like imagine mm-hmm. law and order, not cops, but judges. No. Yeah. Right. Right. And and this was like the most popular show on Hungarian TV in the 1980s. <laughs> Um, and, you know, something that dramatizes not the giant political cases, but the ordinary cases, the human mm-hmm. dramas, the fact that law matters, mm-hmm. that law fixes things, that law, you know, resorting to your own <laughs> violence and force is not the thing you bring something to a court, you know, and but that explains the law. Right. So it's not just about the dispute, but it's mm-hmm. about the. The judge who has to think about, I have this source, that source, you know, this precedent, and so on, and thinks about how to demonstrate to a public, like, what judging is. <laughs> They've had cases like that. We, I mean, weirdly, communist Hungary, that it stopped when Hungary became democratic and probably a bad idea. But, you know, something like that, that shows that the judiciary is more than what's in the headlines. I would think that would be really crucial. Um, great, great idea. Yeah. Are, are there examples, and this will be our, our last question, uh, Kim, this has been very uh, illuminating and I'm very grateful uh, that you've taken time to do this with us tonight. Are there any counter examples from other countries that you're aware of that course corrected and, and restored judicial independence? Uh, and if so, what work there? I mean, you just described an, an interesting yeah television um, television show yeah so one thing that i found really interesting is that um what you find is that people educated in law who have been dragged along into the non-independence of the judiciary there's just again a case in hungary the new president of the supreme court who they, they changed the qualifications to get this guy in, parachuted with him in. Everybody thought he was a political appointee. And he acted as such for a while. And then things got so bad, he flipped. Mm. You know, what you see, and I, I saw a lot of that in, in sort of late stage, you know, communist countries. Partly, you know, people are opportunists. They see the political winds changing and they jump out ahead of them. But some of it is that in the end, things go too far, even for the people who thought they were on board with the autocratic, you know, move. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so again, this goes back to legal training, right? It goes back to that little thing that sits on your shoulder and whispers in your ear and says, the rule of law means that you play it straight, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And so I've seen that happen. And in, in, in judiciaries that have been badly compromised, those same judges may find it in them to be able to switch back. And again, you may need incentives within the judiciary. You know, you may need to replace the judicial leadership, for example, mm-hmm. or like I said, putting this court on top of the system. But, um, you know, if there is political support for an independent judiciary, the judges might find it in them to be more independent. It takes a fair amount of bravery to stand up when all the political winds are going the other direction. So. You know, the thing about a government is that it's, you know, it's like a human body. All the systems are interdependent. It's Mm -hmm. hard to have an independent judiciary if you've got an autocrat killing off all the other independent institutions. Mm -hmm. A free press supports a free judiciary, an independent judiciary. An independent judiciary supports the free press. They all support academic freedom in universities, and they all support, you know, the independence of religious institutions and on and on, right? Which is to say it's an ecosystem of institutions necessary for democracy mm-hmm. that when one goes, it makes all the others vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's that famous, you know, first they came for the whatever and then the whatever and then the whatever, and then they came for me <clears> and there was nobody left to defend me. You can go back to that and say the same is true of independent institutions, you know, which is one reason why, of course, the judiciary is one of the preeminent defenders of in- independent institutions like right. the press, like freedom of religion and in, you know, academic freedom and so on. And so, you know, this is why we all ought to care when you see one independent institution being compromised politically. It means that you might be next, right? 
And so all the other independent institutions that have not been compromised need to come to the defense of, an, of a judiciary that's under attack. So it's an ecosystem problem. You can't have just one independent institution. They all need each other, I think. And so it's a system, right? We all learn that. It's a system of government. Democracy is not just one election or one institution. It's a, it's a system of institutions. So you know, you can start from the political end, you can start from the judicial end, you can start from civil sector and you know, all these people who have gone to the streets in Poland to demand an independent judiciary and demand the government get its hands off the judiciary, you know? Um, and all, any, any of those angles will work, you know? But once you get down to the one last institution still standing, it's very hard for it to remain. Well, we're very grateful that you've spoken out on this Kim, and, and we hope uh, many have seen it, and we intend to uh, uh, try to publicize it as much as we can. I'm grateful again to the uh, Justice Kennedy uh, uh, Institute out in Sacramento, California, that, and Chief Judge uh, Kim Mueller there, who uh, they've partnered with us on this and expanding our outreach, and we'll work hard to uh, get these message, good messages out and uh, get others speaking out um, uh, in defense of an independent judiciary. It's very important to the system as you Great. described it. Keep up the good fight, please. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll continue to work with you. Great. Well, the third, the third program in our Civics in American Democracy series will be held on Wednesday, March 23rd at noon. Uh, retired Judge Tom Griffith from the United States Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia Circuit will join us for a conversation on the importance of an independent federal judiciary. Tom will focus on the internal threats to judicial independence within the United States and discuss his recent experience on the President's Commission to review the Supreme Court of the United States. Registration will open next week for that uh, lecture on the Society's website. The Society also hosts our regular monthly virtual programs over lunch hours, uh, at least on the East Coast, their lunch hours. And the next program is on March 8th at noon. Uh, Walter Starr will speak about Chief Justice Simon P. Chase. Um, Registration is open for Mr. Starr's talk and available on the Society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org. A reminder that a survey will go out tomorrow morning to everyone who registered in advance. Please do respond to it. We want to make these programs as enlightening and as accessible to as many people as possible. And we're so very grateful again uh, to Professor Kim Shepley for her uh, uh, lecture tonight and for her wisdom. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for all for joining us. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>